Change is happening, whether we like it or not, all around us, every second of every day. That's a quote from an email I read recently from a woman who chose to do something different about how we eat and how we nourish our bodies for our physical and mental health. And she's right, of course. As we continue to evolve and grow, change will always be a part of our lives. But it's how we manage that rea our reaction to the changes we encounter that determines whether that change shakes us up and leads to more chaos and uncertainty, or using the change we're experiencing to focus our attention on the actions that need to be taken to mitigate any unnecessary fallout. We all know change can either be messy or illuminating. The choice is always ours, the path we take. Hey there, welcome back to my channel. It's been a minute. So the thing about this email that caught my attention were the dozen or so reminders Molly offered. I expected to read things specifically or only about food and how to eat better, like number one. But things immediately shifted for the better after that. Surprisingly, each was a reminder to me about how we can live a more meaningful life, which just happens to be what this channel is about. And so I thought Molly's list needed to be shared, especially as we're in the beginning days of this new year. Hello, 2023. And it's good to remember these things as we walk ourselves through the next 11 months. Now, to be sure, this is not an exhaustive list by any means of ways to move through life. But by damn, she's got some good ones on there. I've changed some of her wording, but they all encapsulate what she wrote. So thank you, Molly. This one is self-explanatory, but don't forget, Molly's work is about fostering good eating habits. So it makes sense for her to have this and another one later in the list. And I wanna give you some background. I came upon Molly's work after my most recent medical physical. My doc wasn't exactly pleased with my test numbers and she recommended, among other things, that I watch my carb intake. Now, I've been on uh, pr the pre-diabetic side of things on and off ever since I had gestational diabetes in my third trimester with my last child 22 years ago. So I had loads of practice at watching what I eat. But with COVID in 2020 and losing mom in 2021, my better eating habits kind of fell off a cliff. Now was the time to get things back on track and do the work to reduce my weight and eat better as a lifestyle, not just a habit. Now, nobody come up at me with this next one, okay? But we've decided to go keto, to go full force at this and then taper back into a more regular eating lifestyle to maintain any results we get. Molly's reminder of don't forget to eat hit home big time. There's nothing really I could say about this one that you probably don't already know why it's so important. Intentional breathing helps to regulate our bodies and calm our minds. Now, you may have heard of box breathing, also called square breathing. And it's where you do an action, inhale, pause, exhale, pause, for a count of four seconds each. Why does it work? It helps distract your mind, which is a good distraction in this case. It also has the benefit of decreasing bodily stress because certain changes we're experiencing can definitely ratchet up our stress. But I think the best part about intentional breathing is how it works to calm our nervous system, to help quell any racing thoughts. And so you can think clearly about what your next step will be. I love the addendum Molly added to this one. Go outside and let the fresh air kiss your cheeks. I'm not even gonna add any much more to this one except to say, if you don't do this regularly, get your butt outside and go for a walk. Clear your noggin. And while you're there, go sit under a tree uh, or in a park and do some box breathing to bring in clarity. Again, Molly's got it going on. There's only but a small piece of the whole pie of life that you can control. The key to this one is 
creating the habit of letting go of anything not in your purview or area of influence. And if you're struggling to differentiate between what you can and cannot control and are struggling to not insert yourself and take over something, I have a PDF you can download to help you discern what's yours to control and what isn't. I'll leave the link in the description box below. Do your best and let go of the rest. It's important. It's essential for rejuvenation. And sadly, it's very much underrated, I think. Most of us underestimate the amount of sleep we need. Most of us. I don't remember how I discovered it, but about 10 years ago, I realized that my body needs a minimum of six hours of sleep. I can go for longer, but I rarely do. And the reasons I know this is because at the six hour mark, I find myself consciously awake. Most times my eyes are still closed, but I have an awareness of myself, my surroundings. I can hear distinct noises filtering through and find myself thinking about my day. I started tracking my sleep and wake pattern. And practically every time I've been asleep for six hours. I say all this to not regale my sleeping pattern. No, not at all. But to let you know that you too have a pattern of sleep you need to pay attention to. What's the minimum hours of sleep you need for active focus concentration without regularly feeling tired, irritated, or fatigued throughout the day? I also want to add two more to this reminder. Rest and stillness. Each is a different type of downtime, but generally, generally produces the same effects. A sense of rejuvenation, ease, and calm, plus better mental acuity. I think of rest and sleep and stillness as God's special nectars for the body. I am now one of those people who carries a water bottle everywhere with me to quench my thirst, to calm a coughing tickle in my throat, or even to offer another some a small sip. Water plays a key role in our bodily functions to maintain our overall health. I forget sometimes that water makes up 60% of our body's weight. So when we're dehydrated, that's one of the first clues our body gives us that something is amiss internally and needs our attention. And how awesome that for most of us, just drinking a glass of water will right the body and our minds. So it's important to develop a healthy water drinking habit. And if this is your reminder to start or restart, you are welcome. By the way, Molly's addendum for this one is, put some mint in it, repeat. This is probably the only one I slightly disagree with Molly on, or at least I want to pull that thread a little bit. Most people's concept of happiness is joviality, laughter, fun, excitement. But there's also an unintentional societal push, maybe push is too strong a word, to always strive to attain the proverbial euphoric state of happiness. For those who struggle to reach that state in any ongoing basis, they can feel like there's something wrong with them or that they're missing out somehow. Listen, I am by in no way bashing happiness. Nope, not at all. I like to be happy, same as the rest of us. But happiness is such a subjective state. It's something we experience after something happens. I prefer to use the word contentment. I know, tomatoes, tomatoes. But the word itself brings to mind a sense of ease and calm that I feel is inherent in the idea of being content. Contentment is a feeling we carry and internalize. It arises from a sense of satisfaction that can stay with us long term. Happiness can be fleeting and not long lasting. And the thing about feelings is, they are what directs and propels our actions. So in terms of any change you're experiencing, something you're caught in the middle of that's causing some type of disruption in your life or your business, learning how to adapt to the change and finding a way to let go so that you can reach a place of contentment is what's needed so that you can begin the process of understanding what or why it's happening. 
The idea is not to sit and wait for happiness to find you, but to look for ways to be content within yourself and what's happening around you and to work to manifest happy content. On the other side of that happiness coin are your feelings of sadness. Know that I'm talking about a general sadness or feelings of malaise that we all experiencing from time to time. The suggestion Molly gave was spot on to allow it and I wholeheartedly agree. This is the nature of life that ebbs and flows. We will continue to experience ups and downs and when the downs happen that's when we need to not deny what the sadness is about or push it away. Now, this doesn't mean that you wallow in your sad feelings either, but understanding what is bringing them on will ultimately help you step out of it. So yeah, allow it. I have a friend who admits to finding it difficult to ask for support. She is a very capable, intuitive, insightful, and caring person. She is always there for you in any capacity that you need her, but finds it really hard to have the support reciprocated. Now, in some ways, this is about two things, trust, aka external reliance, and fortitude. I can do this thing myself. But sometimes we all need a little bit of help moving through things, buoying us up, or giving us a hug or an atta girl. At the same time, it's also important to understand that receiving help does not equate to you being weak. Heck, no, absolutely not. People around you are the ones you've chosen. Lean in a little bit, ask for what you need. Trust me, if they are in a place to give it to you, to support you, they will. As Molly states, it's because they love you. I love how Molly frames this one. Love is always, always an option. If we start from a place of love and compassion and empathy, especially giving it to ourselves, there is no telling the bonuses to be received when change is afoot and shaking things up. Change, and I'm speaking in terms of love here for this one, change in this respect is about transformation and evolution and metamorphosis, about accepting that this change is going to be a positive thing in your life. That type of thinking stems from love of yourself, mankind, the planet. Too far? Okay, let me take it back down just a little bit. When we sit in the certainty that love is an option, we adjust our direction, our thoughts, and our actions to reflect this. Just like the last one, leaning on friends, that's about love. Something we can access anytime because it first starts with us as individuals and making a regular habit of piling it on ourselves. Be kind to yourself is one of those things that people either dismiss as too esoteric, too froofy, that's a technical term. Like it's a silly thing to say, far less follow. But in my work as a life coach and mentor for entrepreneurs, what I encountered with my first clients were women who were, I would say, not generally kind to themselves in terms of the thoughts they think and the negative beliefs they held were just the norm for them. And as a class half full person, I'm, that really astounded me. Being kind to yourself is not about going out of your way to buy the most expensive gift for yourself. No, nope. almost as a reward for doing the work you're committed to doing. And I'm not saying that buying a gift for yourself is in itself a wrong act. Far from it, no. Being kind to yourself is all the things I previously mentioned. Releasing things, letting go of control of what is not meant for you, drinking more water, eating more healthily, reveling in a happy moment, or allowing your sadness space to exist other than under a rug, getting enough sleep, and of course, rest, sleep, and being still. All of these are ways you can be kind to yourself. Listen, in order to recognize yourself as a friend, you have to be kind to yourself. Give yourself some high fives, rain down some love by indulging in your most favorite activity. Or better yet, go outside and just breathe. 